July 12 is Orangeman's Day and a new flashpoint in Northern Ireland. <laughs> the trouble with long hairs, they're harder to keep in their place. After he listened to the wishes of my people. 10,000 toe lies boo the Prime Minister. Four Corners reports. <laughs> Toll lies from New Britain in the territory of Papua and New Guinea. It was the Toll lies of the Matungan Association who gave the Prime Minister, Mr Gorton, his hostile reception at Rabaul on Thursday. 10,000 of them met Mr Gorton at the Rabaul airstrip to voice their strong dissent. Mr Gorton had the protection of unprecedented security measures, but the reception was generally orderly. Jim Downs went to Rabaul for this report. The liner Marco Polo sails from Rabaul, New Britain. The 300 Australian tourists aboard are mostly still asleep. Air conditioners protect them from the steamy tropical morning. They've had 24 hours in Rabaul, a tropical paradise they've been told by a local tourist brochure, which goes on to say this is a country both old and new, a modern sophisticated playground against a primitive Stone Age setting. And the visitors were promised a greeting by friendly, smiling natives whose watchword is hospitality. But for another visitor to Rabaul this week, not all the natives promised to be friendly. Prime Minister of Australia, Mr. Gorton, is coming to Rabaul. The troublemaker, please. Cause bloodshed to my people in Rabaul. I'm going to let my people Miss this man, not at all. Oscar Tamur, the firebrand member for Kokopo in the Papua New Guinea House of Assembly. Oscar Tamur is patron of the Matongan Association, a fiercely nationalistic movement in the Tolai tribe of North New Britain. In 12 months, Matongan has upended the Australian administration's plans for the Gazelle Peninsula around Rabaul. Primarily, it's a land dispute, but with racial undertones. A section of the Tolai Nation opposes the administration's action of last year in opening membership of the local government council to Europeans and Chinese. And it's about two years now my people have been struggling along on this problem. And when will the government of Australia listen? What them? Papua New Guinea being like a football ground for the Liberal Party of Australia. That's no good. It's about time the wishes and the ideas of my people followed. Tamur, at 28, is an accomplished orator. He was educated in Australia as an army apprentice. Now he's a professional politician. At this meeting, he urged Tolais to stage their own reception for the visiting Prime Minister and to boycott the official welcome. He spoke alternately in Pidgin and Tolai, and because Four Corners was there, he sometimes spoke English. I will stop my people and my children, not to meet a man who caused bloodshed to my leaders, through his policies. And I will stop my people from, from meeting him. And up to now, I've been waiting for an answer, requesting the name of my people to solve my problem. What have I got? Mickey him nothing. All right. I'm ready to shake hands with the Prime Minister of Australia. After he listened to the wishes of my people, and after he recognized our choice according to the Charter of the United Nations. That was the Prime Minister of Australia has failed to do. New Britain Island with New Guinea was a prize of war in 1914. And since then, Australia has both made the rules and paid the bills. Australians have made fortunes here, so have Chinese. But it was the Portuguese who came here first. They called it the Island of Heaven, the less poetic Englishman, William Dampier, loyally called it New Britain. Most of the island is sparsely populated, but here at the northern end, the Gazelle Peninsula, live 2,000 Australians, 2,500 Chinese and 80,000 Tolai. The Tolai want back the land their ancestors sold or traded to Europeans, and this is the cause the Mantangan Association has made its own. 
Matangan has made itself many enemies. It is blamed for splitting apart the Tolai nation, for violence and for quasi-political tactics that some Europeans here see as an echo of the early days of Mau Mau in Kenya. One achievement of Matangan has been to organize, perhaps mobilize, a powerful sector of the Tolai tribe. Matangan calls a meeting. Here it's to plan for the Prime Minister's arrival and people come. <laughs> John Kaputin, the image man of Matangan. His age is about 30. He's had some university education, including study in Hawaii. The visible Matangan leadership is by young men. Kaputin says this is because the young men can speak English, and the only way to talk to white men is in white men's language. Here, he speaks the Tolai tongue. He's a very fine figure of a young man. He was well known. I think it's, it's perhaps normal that getting more education and new ideas, he would want to do something for his people. And uh, he certainly has set out to do that. Um, I, I think it's very easy if you don't agree entirely with the man's politics, it's easy to discredit him and, and uh, write him off. But I, I wouldn't do that. I think he's a man that we'll hear a lot of in the future. I, I must, in all fairness uh, and honesty, say that I cannot agree with the way he's doing it. I, I think John Caperton could accomplish a lot more by commu communicating more with the people that he's opposed to and negotiating with them and telling them what he wants. Alex Hopper, businessman and planter. He turned his wartime deferred pay into a fortune on New Britain Island, but now he thinks he may not stay much longer. Two years ago, I would say, uh, things uh, started to change radically here. The local people began to change their ideas under the influence of education and uh, other things and uh, mostly I would say in the last 12 months. Your intention of getting out fairly soon now, are you going voluntarily in the feeling that you might soon be asked or made to go? I don't really think I'll be asked or made to go. Uh, my own personal opinion is that like any other country that's uh, emerging into independence, there will be some uncomfortable occasions for expatriate people. Uh, I think that this will be resolved, and uh, like many other countries, uh, they will be welcomed back if they have been asked to go. But I, I don't think that the expatriates here will be asked to go. There probably will be some restrictions, uh, this could be. But uh, I think we will resolve our problems much, much uh, more amicably than many of the other colonies. What's the situation going to be when you attempt to dispose of your business interests in Rabaul? Well, if and when I get to that point, I, I don't think there'll be any great problem. Uh, maybe. Uh, there may be a dearth of private buyers, but I know that big business, uh, overseas business, is still very confident in the future of New Guinea. And I, I don't think I'll have a problem there. What sort of threat does the business community feel it's under from native politics? The, the uh, urban area should have nothing to fear. They will always be able to go on dealing with the native customers and clients without any little hindrance. Uh, maybe the, the planting community could be a little uh, disturbed with the possibility of land shortage. Can the urban businessman, though, be confident that, well, Matangan ambition for a start will necessarily end at the town boundaries? I can't imagine the Matangan people uh, doing anything 
uh, violent to the business people. I, they come in and move around amongst us just the same as any other citizen. They've got their political views and they m mostly uh, aim their, uh, their barbs at the administration or at their own uh, people who are in opposition. But I, I can't see any uh, trouble to the business community here. But the eyes of Matangan are already on the business community of Rabaul, run almost without exception by people who are, to the Tolais, foreigners. Matangans know that natives are the biggest market here, and they've seen Chinese fortunes grow from the humblest trade stores. Rabaul's Chinese are Australian citizens, and a lot of their money is already in Australia. Also in Australia is control of the big business of the islands, held almost historically by three companies, Burns Philip, Steamships and W.R. Carpenter. By contrast, the Matangan Association's first business venture is insignificant. This market was built as a gesture of defiance and independence towards the administration-sponsored, council-owned market, where most of the region's produce is sold. The value of the Matangan market is that of basic advertising. See the sign, remember the name. The badge of Mantangan represents a tuk-tuk, a sort of tribal deity. If John Caputin has his way, it will be the emblem of native business enterprise in Rabaul. We are sponsoring the establishment of the New Guinea Development Corporation to be the business uh, operator or developer for our Papuans and New Guineans, although on the Gazelle Peninsula predominantly for the Tolai people, but we are not excluding uh, potential Papuans and New Guineans who wish to buy shares in our corporation, but we are not allowing Chinese or white people to buy any shares in the corporation. What sort of business do you see it doing? We are going into importing and exporting. Eventually we will go into insurance and high purchase uh, dealings. But these are the, the type of things that the foreign people are doing now. We are in fact setting this in opposition to what is in existence today. Haven't there been some efforts like this by native people before that haven't worked? <clears throat> no. Uh, the three projects which were started in the past were all government-sponsored projects. These were the cooperative movement, the savings and loan movement, and the Tolai Koko project. These were part of the whole policy of multiracialism in this country. They were not independent as such, that they would move from just being cooperative to something else. You have a reputation of hating the white man. What do you say about this? If anybody who says this about me has no respect for the education which you people have given to us, I think <clears throat> when you have given an education to somebody, you should expect him to be saying something on behalf of his people. But some of the things that you're reported to have said have been interpreted by the white men as hatred for them. Let me make myself clear. I do not write the news articles or the <clears throat> what is being recorded for televisions in the Australian press. The white people do that. And if they want to paint somebody into some kind of picture as, as being anti-white, they will do that. Well, now you tell me your picture of yourself. I feel that I have had a little more than most Tolai people, or for that matter, Papuans and New Guineans. I have spent a number of years in Australia as well as at the University of Hawaii. Surely this should head up to something which makes me to speak out now for my people. Isn't it a tradition in the Tolai nation that the elders are the leaders and the spokesmen? We are moving into another society <coughs> which requires another type of leadership. It was true that we had in the past uh, elders to carry on this leadership. Now <coughs> the white people are saying that it is a struggle between the young and the old. This is not true at all. Our elders are still there, but for our message, for our <coughs> Uh, thinking to be heard by the white people, it has to be put across to them in their terms, in their own language. And that's where the young people are uh, speaking out today. Tell me about what happened here last December. 
some of our supporters and members turned to straighten up our own leadership on the Gazelle Peninsula. We uh, hit some of our people, but this is also part of our own culture. It is not foreign to us. Uh, you don't only speak here, you also turn to a bit of violence to straighten up your own position here. Does it occur to you that you might have been following a pattern that was set in Germany in the 30s and in Kenya in the 50s? I don't know. I've never read about these places. I'm the problem that the Australians are dealing with, and I know what my problems are. Are you making it, though, a, a, a habit of your association to deal violently with people that don't agree with you? I'm sure Australians somehow uh, are disregarding the fact that they are killing millions of Vietnamese you know, in North Vietnam. Somehow, when we turn to violence here, that is very uh, degrading or something unusual. How important a part do you give violence in the future of Mentaungan? Violence will come. It is not something that will be planned. Uh, it is not something for us to say, all right, we're going to do this. It will come with the feeling of the people, and we should counteract this or anticipate this and reorient our own policies to uh, uh, discount any violence in the future. It has taken you people many centuries to reach the stage where you are today. Uh, you are trying to force your Western civilization into us over a period of maybe a decade or two decades. And what's your reaction to that? I think it is pretty stupid for your people to push this to us in that time. I know that time is changing, but we still, we should uh, bear in mind the problems that our people are faced with, the social attitude which must change to move into another society. Tell me about Thursday and what you think is likely to happen. We are turning out the Gazelle Peninsula for Thursday to meet the Honourable Prime Minister of Australia. We will be demonstrating simply to tell to the world that there are the rights of the black people which must be protected. I believe that those rights at the moment are being corrupted by the colonial administration in this country. It's sometimes said of Montaungan that you your people are not prepared yourselves to negotiate. Is this true? <clears throat> what we are to negotiate on, we are still in the process of achieving our own government. And until we achieve that, we will not make any compromise with anybody. Things have to be the way you want them? <clears throat> this is our country. We will live here. We will die here. So the government must be ours. And we will specify the terms for any foreigners who wish to come into the country to stay under the terms that we would put for them. The New Guinea administration has had help from the Air Force to increase its already oversized police garrison around Rabaul. When the build-up finished, several days before the Prime Minister's visit, there were more than 800 police within a few miles of Rabaul, 150 of them in the formidable riot squad. Mantangan reaction, at least as reported to this meeting, was a verbal challenge. Mantangan President Damien Keriku. I'll be there to face the police and whatever else, and to face the consequences as I promised the cap. And I said to him, we are sick of your bullies and we are prepared to face the consequences of your nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be there watching out for you. And if I don't see you come, I fade away. If I see you come, I, am, I will be happy. I'll be very happy indeed that the future of our country is upheld. Thursday, Keriku said, was to be a day of decision for the Matangan faction of the Tolai tribe. Number one government belong Australia was coming. There were things the Matangan Association wanted to tell him. The Rabaul area usually has 200 police, but it's now the hottest spot in the territory, and a police training camp in the hills provides an emergency reserve of 300 men.
Now he got some fellow man, long rebel here. This was the now big day, and from holding camps in the hills, New Guinea's paramilitary police force assembled at Rabaul barracks. The message of New Britain's police chief to his men was to keep their heads, to listen to their officers, to take no action without direct orders, and to ignore name-calling and provocation from the crowd. From early morning, Matangans assembled at Rabaul Aerodrome. The association ran a shuttle service from the villages, and about an hour before the Prime Minister arrived, the rousing speeches began. Warm beer and betel nut were having their effects. <laughs> So when I talk talk finish, Mr. Gorton, he talk talk. All right, talk talk, Mr. Gorton, he finish. And by going now along town. Now you look him, there's a lot of thousands and thousands of pro multiracials. <laughs> The Mataugans found three targets for their booze. Mr. Gorton was accompanied by the Minister for Territories, Mr. Barnes, and the Administrator, Mr. Hay. Neither is popular with the dissident Tolais. I've been told that Mr. Kapuzin wishes to speak for a short time to ask some questions before I do. Mr. Tumor, not Mr. Kapuzin? Is that right? No, sir. Both. Well, I hope that they will both speak for a short time, after which I will be glad to talk to you. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Oh, there we go. Come on, sir. Come on, it's too long. Yeah, today I'm over there, but I keep on one. I'm afraid. Prime Minister, go ahead, but he's back. Be taken at the tin attacker. It's our part of the TPA, but to a long array. Caputin spoke for more than 20 minutes on the evils of colonialism and the plans of Matangan. Mr. Prime Minister. President Kako, distinguished guests, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. At this point of time, I think it is only appropriate for the Tolai people to express the word of gratitude to the Australian government and its people for the support that we have received in the past. For without this support, we will not be standing here today. Without the industrial 
impetus installed in this country by the colonial power. Without the courage of your men, Mr. Prime Minister, to penetrate some of the remotest aspects of this country, which I believe to be some of the remotest on this planet, we will not be standing here. So for all that you and your people have done for us, I should like to take this opportunity to thank you and your people. But as you have so rightly pointed out in your speech on Monday, <clears throat> that someday the Australian people will have to say no to the annual grant now made available to Papua and New Guinea. This is inevitable, and your people are obliged to do so. <clears throat> and if the Australian government, or rather when the Australian government forfeit this responsibility, it means that we must depend upon our own national resources 